Hello and welcome back. This is part two of the session tonight. I'm going to be talking about um, the Christian community, uh, what that means, some examples of it, what it doesn't mean, some negative examples of it. Um, <clears throat> so, what what does a com Christian community look like? What is the characteristics of the commu Christian community? Um, how do you know the difference between a Christian community and another community or a community that um, perhaps has the sheen of, of, of being a Christian community? Um, if the goal of this class is to be able to more effectively talk about your faith, more effectively talk about why you believe what you believe, you're hopefully going to get into these conversations more and more, or at least more than you had uh, prior to this class. And one common objection that you'll face is that, you know, throughout history, so-called Christians have been responsible for all manner of atrocities and uh, an inor inordinate amount of human suffering. And so to many, um, one of their go-to criticisms is that Christiani Christianity's legacy is really one of oppression. And um, I don't believe that. I, I believe that uh, that isn't the case. And, and this... Uh, next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So often, I've, I've had this happen, perhaps you have, but I'm talking about Christianity and somebody brings up the Crusades. <laughs> so the Crusades were a religious war. They were sanctioned by Pope Urban in 1095. They lasted about 200 years and they were largely ineffective. Um, the goal is to seize holy lands from Islamic rule and uh, it's hard to calculate how many people died, but estimates range from 200 to 300,000. You have the Spanish Inquisition. Um, that began about, uh, what, 300 years later, 200 years later. The goal is to maintain Catholic orthodoxy in all Spanish territories, which that time in history was significant. Uh, this, the Spanish had many territories. So this is characterized by uh, sham tribunals, tortures, and executions. It targeted anyone who did not conform to a strict Catholic orthodoxy, including those of other faith, or those considered to be leading a deviant lifestyle. Um, it was hard to find an accurate number for this, for, for the death toll. Um, the range is 30,000 to 300,000, which is pretty useless. <laughs> and then you have, <laughs> and then you have the larger, uh, more general uh, category of colonialism and imperialism. And this is where, um, whether through the genuine goodness of their heart and desire to spread the gospel or people with ulterior motives would go to a foreign land, a foreign country, a foreign culture, and spread Christianity. Um, sometimes this was done with a genuine heart for God, and other times it was done uh, under the guise of uh, obtaining resources and um, acquiring land. Um, and then we have a big one that is in the news today, uh, sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church has always been sort of dogged by these rumors, but uh, recently in the past you know, six, seven years, there's been, um, I'd say, a watershed moment on this topic. It, it sort of began with, uh, in 2001, there's a team of reporters at the Boston Globe, and they uncovered uh, systemic sexual abuse in the Boston Archdiocese, and they thought it was an isolated case. Turns out, uh, it's a worldwide problem in the Catholic Church, and this has understandably shaken a lot of people's faith in uh, not only organized religion, but even devout Catholics um, are upset by this, and you know they feel betrayed, and rightly so. And so, <clears throat> um, this topic in particular is one that continues to uh, reverberate. There was a 2015 movie that talked about the Boston Globe and the spotlight and the investigation and everything that happened after. And how many of you guys saw that movie? How many of you remember at the very end when the credits were rolling, when they listed all the other places that sexual abuse had been uncovered? That was shocking. Al Albany, New York was on the list. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> This past August, a report came out that said 300 priests in Pennsylvania were responsible for abusing more than 1,000 children. Um, so it's still, you know, revelations are still coming out. The Vatican in, in Rome is, is obviously paying attention and uh, responding to this 
to this crisis. And then there are uh, other more modern examples, these guys. Westboro Pap Baptist Church, they're known for uh, protesting the funerals of veterans. They're known for their signs, uh, their tagline, God hates fags. That's one of their, uh, that's one of their call signs. Uh, this is Joel Osteen, the Prosperity Gospel. He, um, he was criticized a couple years ago for seeming not to open a megachurch that could fit 16,000 people um, during the floods in Houston. He disputes those claims. He says that, you know, the church was flooded or whatever, but the, but the fact remains that um, many people, uh, especially on social media, took this as just another example of, of Christian hypocrisy. And the bigger problem, I think, with Joel Osteen is not that he, you know, did or did not open his church. It's, it's with his message, the prosperity gospel, that preaches if you donate to the church, you can buy God's blessings on your life. It's a very problematic uh, doctrine. Uh, that's Joel Osteen's house right there pictured. It's $10.5 million. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's in a rich suburb of Houston. Um, John Oliver his very popular show last week tonight devoted a 25, 20, 25 minute segment to the uh, to mega churches and to the prosperity gospel and the hypocrisy associated with pastors and uh, others who, who follow this doctrine and, and, and preach it. And it's got 24 million views on YouTube. Who is this? He is a um, J John Oliver. He uh, just Google last week tonight. Uh, Mega churches, and it'll come up. It's got 24 million views on YouTube. Uh, I'm not even going to go into the way that Christianity intersects with, or people in politics try to bring Christianity into their into their campaigns, into their uh, messaging. Um, and whether or not it's fair. Uh, or accurate to conflate these examples of, of you know, Christianity in, in, in the culture with actual true Christianity. The fact remains that it has to be confronted and dealt with. It, you know, you're going to have these conversations with people, and you have to be able to know what to say, because that's one of the first barriers that's going to pop up. You know, what about all the hypocrisy that we see? It's important to acknowledge it, and it's important to address it. So. Um, in the interest of that, uh, in, in counteracting this message, it's important to, to point out that God hates hypocrisy. It's, there's many places in the Bible that illustrate this truth. In 1 John 4.20, it says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. It's hard to, anything that I had talked about in the past 10 minutes, you know, Crusades, the Inquisition, sexual abuse, God hates fags. In no way could you construe that with loving your brother, I believe. I don't believe that persecuting and physically abusing people and, and hurting people in the name of God is, is actually love. I, that, that'd be a really hard argument to, um, to, to present in any real way. Uh, in James 1, verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So those exa negative examples I, met, I mentioned, um, they sort of, some of them have the sheen of, of being godly, right? You have um, the Crusades were meant to get back, our, you know, the lands that were in the Bible that were important to our faith, and it's, it's they, you could, if you were, if you were um, predisposed to agree with, with that argument, you could see yourself strapped on a sword and traveling to the Levant and, and, and fighting a holy war. Um, and same with the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, you know, ostensibly it was to nail down the, the Catholic orthodoxy and, and to solidify Catholic beliefs in the Spanish territories. And it was the way that, in which they did that, though, that was the problem. These are examples of, 
of um, you know movements or people who are, are you know have the Bible. They have they have the Bible in their hands and they choose to um, you know read it, but they but they choose to do things in the name of God that are not godly. And that's what we're dealing with here. And that's what every religion, uh, as far as I know, that, that, that's a component of, of, of the various faiths that, that are in the world. Um, or not, they're not a component of the faith. There's something that you have to counteract. As Christians, there's something that we have to counteract and be prepared to counteract. One more place here. It says in 1 John 2, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And how do we know how Jesus walked? We read the Gospels. Where in the Gospels did Jesus nail somebody to a wall and say, you know, you must believe how I believe. You must believe that the Father sent me and that I am the Messiah. Nowhere. Where in the Gospels did he pick up a sword and, and lead a revolt against the Roman government? Nowhere. You won't find it. So, what does a genuine Christian community look like? Enough with that stuff. <laughs> Let's get to the, to the better stuff. What does a genuine Christian community look like? Um, Sean turned me on to this guy. Uh, well, first, let's read this. So, um, in John 13, 34, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one, one another. By this... All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What's the operative word here? The main love, love one another. Um, Sean turned me on to this guy. His name's uh, well, this event. Uh, there's this, this guy named Cyprian. He was born in about I think 200 A.D. Um, in modern-day Tunisia, in North Africa, a place called Carthage. And uh, when he was 35 years old, he was baptized. Um, and this next part that I'm going to read it, uh, doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, this topic of Christian community. It has to do with what Cyprian wrote about his conversion and his, ex his, his God experience that changed his life. But I thought it was interesting enough that, that it's worthwhile. Um, this is from one of his early works that he wrote. He says, I, when I was still lying in darkness and gloomy night, I used to regard it as extremely difficult and demanding to do what God's mercy was suggesting to me. I myself was held in bonds by the innumerable errors of my previous life. He was 35 when he, uh, when he was baptized. From which I did not believe I could possibly be delivered. So I was disposed to acquiesce in my clinging vices and to indulge my sins. But after that, by the help of the water of the new birth, the stain of my former life was washed away, and a light from above, serene and pure, was infused into my reconciled heart. A second birth restored me to a new man. Then, in a wondrous manner, every doubt began to fade. I clearly understood what had first lived within me enslaved by the vices of flesh, was earthly, and that what instead the Holy Spirit had wrought within me was divine and heavenly. Those are the words of a man who had a God experience, an encounter with God, and it changed him forever. So in 250 AD, um, a plague broke out, spread across the Roman Empire, and there was a church historian who wrote, uh, named Eusebius, who wrote uh, less than 100 years later about how the Christians in Carthage responded to this plague. Um, and uh, the following is from an article written by Sean uh, Finnegan based on Eusebius' writings. So in 250 uh, AD, a pandemic broke out across the Roman Empire, infecting thousands, perhaps even millions. Thousands died daily, afflicted with horrible symptoms, including diarrhea, vomiting, burning eyes, loss of limbs, loss of hearing, and loss of sight. Pontius, a deacon in the congregation at Carthage, noted how the city was littered with no longer bodies, but the carcasses of many. The stench of death must have been unbearable as the plague ravaged house after house. Dionysus, the pastor of the congregation at Alexandria, relates the following description. They pushed away those with the first signs of the disease and fled from their dearest. They even threw them half dead into the roads and treated unburied corpses like refuse 
in hopes of avoiding the plague of death, which for all their efforts was difficult to escape. And um, Shaw goes on to write, but even if fear and panic shot through the hearts of the people, not knowing who would be next, the Christians, in contrast, responded quite differently. Rather than ditching their loved ones, they bravely cared for their own, making sure their sick had the necessary provisions and sanitation to get better. Of course, nursing someone sick of a communicable disease in the ancient world was extremely risky. Dionysus goes on to tell us how severe it was. They would also take up the bodies of the saints, close their eyes, shut their mouths, and carry them on their shoulders. They would embrace them, wash them, and dress them in burial clothes, and soon receive the same services themselves. This is from Eusebius' Church History in uh, Book 7, Chapter 22. So if you can imagine this, you have a scene like this. You go outside, and there is vomit and blood and dead bodies in the street. There are animals gnawing on carcasses. The smell, like you go inside or you go into the country and you still have the stench of death on your clothes. And what these Christians would do is they would pick up mangled half-dead bodies and they would throw them over their shoulder. They would shut their eyes and close their mouth to try to, I guess, stop any kind of, which is actually very smart, stop any kind of infection from, from, from coming into their bodies. And they would take them to a house and they would care for them. When everybody else in the city was avoiding, was throwing their sons and brothers and fathers and daughters and mothers, mothers out into the street so that they could die and not infect the rest of the population. The Christians were taking them into their homes, even their enemies, it, uh, Eusebius writes. Undaunted by death and without putting their own well-being first, they reached out, the Christians reached out to the dying pagans all around them as well. Christian leaders urged their flocks to extend loved ones, extend love even to even their enemies. So then this is from Eusebius, uh, his church history. Then afterwards, he, Cyprian, uh, subjoined, he said that there was nothing wonderful in cherishing our own people with only with people only with the needed attentions of love, but that he might become perfect, who would do something more than the publican or the heathen, who overcoming evil with good and practicing a clemency which was like the divine clemency, loved even his enemies, who would pray for the salvation of those who, that persecute him, even as the Lord admonishes and exhorts. Sean writes, at great personal risk, they reached out to the infected pagans and nursed them back to health, or else guaranteed they died without lacking care or company. Although Christians died in great numbers, their fellow brothers and sisters regarded them fortunate to have given their lives on behalf of others. It turns out that this pestilence coincided with one of the greatest periods of growth for third century Christianity. Why do you think that is? Yeah. I can imagine just how eager an unbeliever would be to hear the gospel after being abandoned by his own family and nursed back to health by courageous, loving Christ followers. Sorry, I should have went to that earlier. Anybody, has anybody heard of what happened in 2006 in uh, Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania? A gunman went into a, an Amish school and shot 10 little girls, five of which died. And then he killed himself. This is from the uh, Wikipedia page on the on the shooting, it says, uh, on the day of the shooting, a grandfather of one of the murdered Amish girls heard warning, was heard warning some young relatives not to hate the killer, saying, we must not think evil of this man. Another Amish father noted, he had a mother and a wife and a soul, and now he's standing before a just God. The, a spokesman for the family of the man who committed this act said that an Amish neighbor com comforted um, the Roberts family, the, the, the guy's name um, was Charles Roberts, hours after the shooting and extended forgiveness to them. Amish community members visited and comforted Roberts' widow, parents, and parents-in-law. One Amish man held Robert's sobbing father in his arms reportedly for as long as an hour to comfort him. Uh, the Amish also set up a charitable fund for the family, the shooter, and about 30 members of the Amish community actually attended the uh, the shooter's funeral. An NPR story at the time said, uh, Charles Roberts wasn't Amish, but Amish families knew him as the milk truck driver who made deliveries. Last month it was announced that the Amish community had donated money to the killer's widow and her three young children. It was one more gesture of forgiveness, gestures that began soon after the shooting. NPR interviewed a sociologist who studied 
the Amish community. His name's Donald Craybill. And he said, I think the most powerful demonstration of the depth of, of Amish forgiveness is when members of the Amish community went to the killer's burial service at the ceremony, at the cemetery, I'm sorry. Several families, Amish families, who had buried their own daughters just the day before were in attendance and they hugged the widow and hugged other members of the killer's family. Uh, pictured here is the mother of the killer. She wrote a letter that said, um, your love for our fa to the Amish community that said, your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. Gifts you've given have touched our hearts in ways that no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing the world. And for this, we sincerely thank you. This story went uh, worldwide. So those are two somewhat extreme examples of a genuine Christian community. One from, you know, many hundreds of years ago and one from, what, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it may be. Um, and there are other examples uh, throughout history. Um, And even you know, even in, in, in recent history, so where is the Christian community? Like those are extreme examples, but what what are we doing here today in our in our church and in our community? Um, up on the board here, I have uh, a picture of Schenectady, a picture of Troy, a picture of Albany, a picture of Living Hope, where we are right now. Unless you're watching us online, um, the answer to the question. Uh, where is the Christian community? Is it's here? It's right where you're standing, wherever you may be around the world. Uh, in the teaching of the Good Samaritan in in, uh, in Luke, it's it, you know Jesus says, which of these men do you think was the you know was the was the man who was robbed his neighbor, you know the man and they they answered rightly you know the man that showed compassion and love to him, that man wasn't necessarily their his his physical neighbor it it, it applies to everybody it applies to anybody that's in your orbit. So we have an authentic Christian community here at Living Hope, I believe that, and it's something that we've been talking about in Sean's fellowship and also on Sunday, uh, Reverend Finnegan mentioned um, his, his presentation with, with his wife Mimi was about um, Christian grandparenting and what you can do in your community. He talked at length that you know, acts that have been done in this very community, uh, in this very room of, of people who have stepped up and, and demonstrated true and genuine love. Um, we recently started a benevolence ministry team where you'll get an email if there's a need in the church and you can respond back with, with, with what, you, what you can do to help, whether it's driving somebody somewhere or making food or there's any number of things. On Sunday, we have the, the AV booth, we have music, the music ministry, we have food service, we have uh, any number of, of activities that you can get involved with to, um, to demonstrate and live out Christ's teaching of, of, of love and of service. Um, it doesn't have to be some life-altering, you know, you don't have to expose yourself to a deadly plague or go on an overseas missions trip to be part of a Christian community, an authentic one that's, that's effective. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14, it says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. In verse 15 it says, if the foot should say, I, I, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, make it not, that, would make it, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. This is uh, Paul's vision for the Christian church. It's made up of individuals who all work together in concert to, to further uh, the spread of the gospel in the way that uh, you spread the gospel is, yes, you have the gospel message, but people respond to how you treat others around you and how you treat your fellow Christians, how you, so many people have come to this church and stayed because of the community here. Mm 
And that same goes for, for churches across the country. It's, it's the way that you act. It's not what you say or the, you know, the gospel message in and of itself. It's, it's that and then the demonstrated day in, day out, small acts that add up to this Christian community that we're supposed to embody uh, as part of the body of Christ. Paul is saying here, the body of Christ is Christian communities made up of many members. Every member is important and all members contribute to the work of the body. And there is a place for you in the Christian community, regardless of your background or perceived shortcomings. The point here is that you can be part of the body, wherever you are. Indeed, you are called to be part of the Christian community. In whatever capacity you can contribute, there is a place for you. You do not have to expose yourself to a deadly plague, as I said, or embark on some life-altering mission. It could be something as small as parking far farther away at a Sunday service so that the elderly have an easier time getting into the building. Or cooking a meal for a family who recently lost a loved one, helping someone move, talking to someone unfamiliar after a Sunday service, noticing someone is hurting, and asking them in an authentic way if they want to share what's on their mind. It can be as big as taking someone into your home who needs help or traveling overseas on a missions trip. Or going to seminary to become a pastor if that's what God has called you to do. There are countless examples in this very community of people doing all of those things and more in pursuit of living out this idea of an authentic Christian community. The defining characteristic we see in the Bible of an authentic Christian community is one of love. In John 13, verse 35, it says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how people will know that you're a true Christ follower and that you're part of a true Christian community if you love one another. Galatians 6.10, it says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith, especially each other. Our behavior and actions within our own Christian community and towards those within our orbit speaks louder than any billboard or advertisement or, you know, come to my church speech could. The small everyday actions we take to embody the teachings of Christ add up to a portrait of love and service that those who are on the outside find intriguing and irresistible. A true, authentic Christian community should disturb anyone who encounters it, but is not part of it. It should compel them to want to know more, to want to know why we're different than any other group or culture they've encountered. An authentic Christian community should reflect the life of Christ and beckon to those on the outside to come in and see what this is about. It should compel them to learn who Christ is and in turn, who they were meant to be. Awkward pause. <laughs> so we'll open it up to a QA.